It is six minutes after 10. And coming from the open line, we now move into our second hour. I'm delighted to be joined by someone who I think is one of the most incisive political analysts on the South African political landscape, Ukoko Tungezweni Obri Machikli. Koko, thank you so much for joining us for this hour. People have been uh, coming to my door with pitchforks <laughs> saying if I don't interview you again, because we had a great conversation uh, a few a few weeks ago on YouTube, if I don't interview you again, that uh, my life is in, in, in serious <laughs> danger. So I've delivered on my side. Thank you. Um, thanks so much for joining us. And, you know, it's funny right now in the South African political landscape because I think on the one hand, there's a great deal of just fatigue, particularly on the battles between the president and the public protector. I find myself not really wanting to listen to much more about it because people's heels have, have dug in and people's views are set in stone and it's very hard to have a, a nuanced and a balanced discussion mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. this. But at the same time, we can't ignore it. You know, this goes to the very heart of our democracy. It goes to the heart of what it means to be a citizen and a president. Mm. Mm. And so um, I just want to get your feelings on, on the nature of this debate and the tenor of this debate right now on the president and the revelations about his campaign. Well, you are right. We, we, we can't ignore it, as tiring as it is. Mm. And there's a very good reason why. The reason is precisely because we fought a liberation struggle against colonialism and apartheid, we can't ignore this. Because um, in some ways, when we talk about so many millions of friends going into the campaign of a single politician in an ANC leadership uh, battle, uh, you are talking about why we fought a liberation struggle and why we thought the ANC would be the vehicle through which we fight that liberation struggle or we fight a revolution. And we need to remind ourselves of that when, when we have these conversations, that the liberation struggle was a struggle about the creation of a society that in its social, moral, economic, political, cultural, and other forms of content would be antithetical, would be the antithesis of apartheid society. But that's not an end in itself. Because if you achieve that, that, achieve, that achievement becomes the means towards the achievement of a higher goal. The higher goal is the creation of a society that is qualitatively better even than that society which is the antithesis of apartheid society. And that goal is an ongoing and eternal goal. Another reason why we should not get tired of talking about this is to remind ourselves that South Africa belongs not to those who live in it, at least not all of them. South Africa belongs to those who conquered it. Or if you want to be kind, South Africa belongs uh, to all who live in it, except when it comes to the economy. So South Africa, except when it comes to the economy, belongs to all who live in it. And that goes to the heart of the matter, of the motives, possible motives, behind these obscene amounts being donated to a single leader of the ANC in an ANC leadership battle. The question is, what is that money buying? This may not apply to all the donors, but I think the preponderance of those who made the donations, what they were buying and what they are buying is a society that will not be antithetical to the social, economic, political, and cultural content of apartheid society. In other words, they are buying the retention of the status quo. And the ANC being the dominant party, that's the best vehicle through which uh, you achieve that. So the ANC, in a way, plays a dual role. For some, it is a vehicle for revolution. For others, it is a, a vehicle for the retention of the status quo, particularly in the form of white privilege. I think that's 
such a useful way to to get deeper into this question because I think a lot of the current political debate in South Africa remains at the surface level. You know, he said, she said, I feel this way and therefore I'm not going to consider another another view. And a lot of that right now rests on the question of legality or illegality, which is one question. But then there's another question which is about hypocrisy, mm. which has nothing to do with legality or illegality um, because... We'd probably be all arrested if hypocrisy was illegal. Uh, including myself. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, and uh, my hand is also up. But I do think nobody has really asked how on the one hand, and, and again, we, we can apply this to, to other parties as well, there's a rhetoric of revolution and a national democratic revolution which is apparently being waged. I'm not sure against whom this revolution is now being waged, but... How does a national democratic revolution get funded by the status quo billionaires who seem to be living rather well off the, mm. the society that is pre-revolutionary? Well, the question you ask is very important because it is seldom the case. In all probability, it is never the case that one social group will fight for social change on behalf of another. And therefore, the idea that the elites um, will fight for revolution uh, for the benefit of those who are poor, those who are workers, and those who are victims of uh, colonialism and apartheid is a fallacy. Uh, and therefore, when they make these contributions, sometimes disguising the contributions um, behind an agenda for democracy, behind an, ag uh, an agenda for change, we should know that it is never the case, or if we must be kind, it is seldom the case that one group will fight for social change on behalf of another. And, and, and the sec second thing we must remember, you talk about a national democratic revolution. Those are words, three words. Um, words are not what they describe. The word cat is not a cat. The word stone is not a stone. The three words, national democratic revolution, are not a national democratic revolution. The struggle is about bridging the gap between words and what they describe. Now, if you give people a choice between words and what the words describe, uh, I think everyone will, will err on the side of choosing what the words describe, the reality they describe. Our problem in South Africa today is that very few of the words our politicians, our leaders, our political parties across the political spectrum use are descriptive of the, of the uh, um, reality uh, that will come as an outcome of the revolution. So our struggle is to bridge the gap between words and what they describe. And, and today, we are being shown quite clearly um, how important that difference is because you had a dominant narrative of angels and devils mm. when, as I keep on saying, the battles in the ANC are between angels with horns and devils with halos. And what they have in common is a God complex. Another thing they have in common is a very poor understanding of the limitations of their own power. And because of that, they always think the actions of their opponents are predictable. And that is why, in some way, Cyril Ramaphosa and those who support themselves find themselves here, because they benefited from a narrative of angels and devils, and they were the angels. The word angel is not an angel. Now we're beginning to see the gap between the words and reality. Absolutely. And I think as you say that, and, and I love this motif of, of angels with horns and, and devils with halos, maybe... Some parts of South African society, some parts of the media have become seduced by this very binary narrative. And it just seems to me that what we also need to ensure we don't lose sight of is a very stringent critique of Ramaphosa even, of the difference between the rhetoric and now the reality that's emerging, does not mean that one seeks to exonerate Zuma. You're right. Um, in fact, I had a conversation with someone yesterday in which I was saying it, it's not helpful 
to reduce our challenges to Zuma, to Mbeki, to Mandela, or today to Cyril Ramaphosa. The problem is the ANC. The problem is an ANC, in my view, that was captured before the 1994 democratic breakthrough. That's the problem. <coughs> Sorry. And therefore, one of the critical questions we must ask about the ANC is whether it remains an instrument for the advancement of the revolution. In other words, for too long, people have confused the ANC with the revolution. Uh, they've talked about the two as being synonymous, whereas there's the ANC on the one hand and the revolution on the other. The ANC is a vehicle for revolutionary change. Now, of course, if we come to the conclusion that it is no longer an effective instrument for revolutionary change, we must discard it. Or alternatively, we must change it. That's the conversation the ANC and the society must have. But at the same time, we, we put too much importance on the capacity of the ANC to talk about change and to effect change, as if change can only come through the ANC. The manner in which the a ANC changes and will change will be as a result of both internal and, ex and external forces. If you look at the ANC being an organization that is in a state of decline, in all probability, if it stays in the current, uh, on the current tra uh, trajectory, uh, change will come because of external forces, not because of how it changes inside. We see the battle within the ANC raging at the moment, although at the same time, again, there's this rhetoric of unity which has, been last, which has lasted for at least, a, at least a decade, if not more now. And we see this recently with the, the, the spat between former cabinet minister Derek Hanekom and former president Jacob Zuma, who after the state capture commission, which was when we were speaking, um, while some allegations or spy allegations were being made about other people, then took to Twitter and accused Hanekom of being a, quote, enemy agent. And Hanekom has taken great umbrage at those statements. What do you think this battle that is now again going to be played out within the courts reflects about where we find ourselves and where the ANC finds itself at this moment? Well, let's start with the courts. Hmm. But by the time the review application uh, against the findings and the remedial action of uh, the public protector in relation to the Busasa donation is completed, the political damage either to those who support Ramaphosa and Ramaphosa himself on the one hand and his opponents will already be done. Hmm. In other words, political processes, political battles in terms of their outcome tend to run much faster than legal processes. Now, what the media leaks mean is that the damage is already being done uh, to Ramaphosa and those who support him. And to some extent, actually, whatever the outcome of the review application, uh, the review application has become irrelevant. But, <coughs> sorry, but what we must remember about these allegations of who was an apartheid spy and who was not, mm. there is no member of the ANC was an apartheid spy. That's the first thing. Secondly, all members of the ANC were apartheid spies. <laughs> so that's, that's the conundrum. Uh, we will have to contend with. Why do you, why do you say that? That's, that's a, quite a provocative statement. Well, let me add a third leg to oh that Oh my goodness, argument. just when I thought the provocations were done. So while I'm saying no member of the ANC mm. was an apartheid spy, and all members of the ANC were apartheid spies, mm. it is common cause that the ANC was infiltrated. Now, of course... Those who infiltrated the ANC, who were apartheid spies and apartheid agents, conscious and unconscious, because some of the agents were not conscious, find themselves on different sides of the factional battle. Now, we focus narrowly, of course, on these battles. And we forget to have a conversation about why was the ANC infiltrated in the first place. It was infiltrated precisely because a certain form of change had to be prevented from coming into being. The kind of society I'm talking about, which is the antithesis 
of apartheid society, which itself qualitatively must become better than that antithesis, is the reality socially, politically, and economically we had to prevent from happening by capturing leaders and members of the ANC in an attempt to capture the ANC itself. Why? We had to retain the status quo. And what is the status quo about? Another way of looking at uh, colonialism and apartheid is this. Because of colonialism and apartheid, what is in essence a numerical majority has become a cultural majority. Minority. Cultural majority. Ah, right, right, right. Yes. Sure, sure. So, so, the, so, the, so the, what is yeah. in essence a numerical minority right, has become right. a cultural majority. Sure, sure. And those who are the numerical majority are the cultural mi mi uh, mm. minority, which means uh, it is through the eyes, the ways of being, the ways of seeing, and the worldview of the cultural majority that we reflect social, political, economic, and other realities. Which means, of course, that it is through the lens of whiteness hmm. that we reflect social, political, economic, and social reality in South Africa. In other words, here I'm not talking about skin color. I'm talking about the logic. I'm talking about a system, a way of being, a way of seeing, a worldview that has become dominant sure. and is the, is the worldview of the cultural majority. You know, that's, that's such an important point because I want to ask quite a provocative question here, but to what extent is our preparedness to forgive President Ramaphosa linked to that proximity to the extent that in many ways I feel like because Ramaphosa makes himself legible to power in our society, we're much more prepared to forgive him for wrongdoing than we are for other leaders who maybe sometimes do the same things but don't do it in the way that is seen through the eyes of the cultural majority. You are right. You, you, you had Jacob Zuma um, and at the end of his uh, uh, tenure as president, corruption has, has become not endemic, but systemic, has become the dominant Completely. culture in the, in the state and the private sector. Mm. But that's not the primary thing which offended people about uh, Jacob Zuma when he was contesting the presidency um, of the ANC against former President Tabombeke. He, he offended and to some extent defied the liberal democratic aesthetic. And, and, and two things arise there. Because of how he embraced his Zuluness and the optics of how he embraced that, he offended the liberal democratic aesthetic, which is a very important element of whiteness and, 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 and uh, the cultural majority. But at the same time, in doing so, he was deploying his Zuluness to advance a very, a very narrow Zulu nationalistic agenda mm. Mm. from which the ANC benefited um, in, in 2009 when he became president of the country, uh, which of course, uh, of course undermined uh, the IFP in KZN. So if you look at the proximity you're talking about, if you compare the two leaders, the, the reason why we're less critical of uh, Cyril Ramaphosa is because of that cultural proximity to the worldview of the cultural majority, as opposed to uh, Jacob Zuma, who offends the sensibility of the cultural majority. Of course, some people are going to do a, a leap of logic and argue that I'm defending uh, Jacob Zuma, and I think we should just ignore that. Um, so... The ANC itself, um, which has, because of its multiple identities, one part of its identity has been that of an organization that has been more like a civil, a civil rights movement than a revolutionary movement. And, 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 and also, uh, then you see some proximity on parts of the ANC developing 
between it and the cultural majority to the extent that the cultural majority succeeds to some extent um, in, in ensuring that elements of the ANC subordinate themselves to its will, to its interests, and to its worldview. Now, that's not the same as arguing that inside and outside the ANC there are no counter-narratives. There are. Sure. Uh, but the master narrative is holding in place. And as you say, it has seduced too many uh, in the media. But that is also because of the nature of the media or the nature of news. That news is not valueless. It's value-laden. And, I wanna, and, and, and it's socially constructed. I want to come on to that because I want to have a full discussion about just questions that surround the media in South Africa, which I think we need to we need to have as a society. But just linking what you've said now and, and your response to the earlier question about the multiple identities that go into a, a party like the ANC, which, which currently governs us, and, and the many complicities that, that we ignore, what about the, the other aspects of infiltration, say, for example, from homeland leaders into the ANC? You've already spoken about a, a more nationalistic ethos that was incorporated into the ANC in some ways through the Zuma tenure. What are some of the other strands that, that contribute to this very multifaceted and sometimes self-contradictory identity? And what are those complicities that we need to think through? Well, uh, remember, people keep on saying that the ANC is a broad church. To me, the ANC is a church of different denominations. It's not a single church. It is, it is a church of churches. Um, in fact, even the church of Satanism is part of this broad church. <laughs> if you look at the corruption, the state capture, sure, so-called sure. so -called state capture, because there's no such thing, but, but we'll come back to that on another day, <laughs> on another occasion. Um, and then you, 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 you dissect its multiple identities. Firstly, it's a social movement. It's a civil rights movement. Um, it's a revolutionary movement. It's a liberation movement. It's a modern parliamentary uh, political party. But it is also a haven uh, for those who want to undermine um, and arrest revolutionary change. And when I said that change of the ANC and in society will occur because of what's happening inside and outside. The ANC has both an internal and external dimension. I am saying to you, let's not discuss the ANC's infiltration in, in a narrow sense. Uh, the, 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 the tentacles, or some of the tentacles that got attached to the ANC are transnational in nature, including transnational companies acting in pursuit of profit, but also acting in the interests of the countries and regions from which they come. Because in the end, for those whose interests are dominant in the world economy, a process of replication of their interests must happen, a process of reproducting their, reproducing their, um, their logic um, must happen. And when you have identified a movement that has popular support, one of the means through which you replicate your interests if you succeed is through such um, a movement. I'm uh, going to have to ask you to stop at that key juncture. We'll return to that conversation. After the headlines with Tabo Baloi, we're in conversation with Ukoko Aubrey Machikli, analyzing all that's happening in a much deeper way than you might find elsewhere in South African politics. 25 minutes to 11, I'm Sizwe Mpofu Walsh, and we're in conversation with Koko Tungezweni Aubrey Machikli, one of the finest political analysts, in my view, in the country, and your tweets have been streaming in. I'm streaming and I'm getting a piece of Ukoko Aubrey Machikli. Can we please have the podcast, please? Don't worry, it'll be on the way soon. And there'll also be a YouTube video. Uh, Human Dignity says it's refreshing to hear diversity of voices by political analysts and another tweet says numerical minority but cultural majority i oh wait i need uh, oh yes i need impepo <laughs> after what ukoko is teaching koko <laughs> um, we we've been talking a little bit about some of the myths that have been surrounding the, the ramaphosa presidency 
and the need to disentangle those myths in, in aid of, of, a, of a more honest democracy. But I think it's also important, and I can't stress this enough, to, to say that that doesn't mean that the Zuma era does not need to be radically critiqued. That doesn't mean that the public protector hasn't made a number of, quite frankly, shameful errors or may, in fact, also be you know, in an equally problematic position. And so this notion that because one person has done something bad, that means that another has mm. done something yeah. good, has really started clouding our political debate in ways that I think are very unhelpful for our democracy. Well, the reason that happens is because the human mind plays tricks on us. Uh, we like to see ourselves reflected in a discourse. Uh, and what offends us is that which does not confirm our pre-existing views and that which we like, whether it is uh, based on truth or not, uh, we like because it confirms our pre-existing views. But when you look at the Zuma period and the current Ramaphosa period, you are right, we need to be a bit more nuanced and a, a bit more critical. Firstly, both the Zuma presidency and the Ramaphosa presidency are a product of the same decline of the ANC. They are a product of the same problems we have in our democracy, which is a liberal um, democracy. They are a product of the same weaknesses in that liberal democracy. And just in passing, let me say this, we, we need to have a conversation about whether liberal democracy still serves us and still serves anyone in the world, for that matter, particularly in the manner in, in which it has become attached to capitalist impulses and the extreme individualism that has produced, uh, which in a sense um, has promoted very narrow interests globally, which have produced, um, in opposition to them, Brexit and the Donald Trump presidency. But let's leave that for hmm. um, another day. I, I, I refer to the Zuma presidency or the Zuma period as darkness at noon. I, I base this on a novel by Abba Kessler, which came out in the 1940s, which is um, a novel, I think I've told you about this before, um, based on a revolution betrayed. I look at uh, Surya Ramaphosa and the New Dawn. To me, Surya Ramaphosa is the Nongause of 2019. <clears throat> I don't know whether you know the story of Nongawuse. Mm. Mm. For those who don't know the story of Nongawuse, during the frontier wars in the Eastern Cape, uh, the anti-colonial uh, wars, uh, Nongawuse, who, like me, was gifted, uh, goes to her father to say, the ancestors have come to me. And they say we should destroy our fields, kill our cattle, sheep, goats, and everything, because the day after we do that, the sun will rise, in the West and set in the East. And as it rises in the West, it will rise with cattle, sheep, and so on. And the fields will grow again, and there'll be plenty, and there'll be prosperity in the land. Now, of course, historical opinion is divided about whether she actually saw the ancestors, or whether this was a trick the colonizers played on her. And the same questions must be asked about Sarah Ramaphosa, because as I say, the new dawn is the story of a modern day no house as far as I'm concerned. Hmm. I think one of the fascinating things that arises from, from what you've said, both about President Zuma and President Ramaphosa and how you've in many ways drawn them into the same boat is, is we often think there's a, a zero sum nature to these political battles. Let's take the public protector and, and Ramaphosa. Right now, the prevailing consensus is one, one will survive and one will, will not. But it's actually quite possible that both don't survive. Well, the, the, the possibility... Um, let, let's start with what, what, what's happening here, first of all. So those who support Ramaphosa argue that uh, the public protector is captured, mm. is part of an agenda to destroy the president... And at the head of that agenda is former President Jacob Zuma. Mm. Well, the possibility that we're dealing with two parties that are captured. 
by different agendas. On the other hand, you are dealing with two parties that are not captured in this way. Um, Ramaphosa may not be a puppet of white capital, but there are many in white capital who see themselves as ventriloquists and therefore will treat him as such. In the same way, Busisi Mkwebane may not be um, a puppet of those who perpetrated so-called state capture, but there may be too many in that camp who see themselves as ventriloquists. But in that battle, uh, what people must remember is that when you go to battle, you must dig two graves, just in case. You may need a grave yourself. So it is in that context that I want to agree with you that actually we may end up with two graves here, not one. Hmm. Well, the question arises as well out of that about how we as a society reflect these, these complex battles. You tweeted recently, and, and I thought this was really, really interesting, about just, just the way that different parts of, of the South African media on both sides of, of this binary battle that we've been building for ourselves have, have entrenched their positions. And you said, we must avoid becoming the brides and bridegrooms and cheerleaders of any narrative because the divorce may be physically, emotionally, and psychologically painful. Yes, because I, I'm looking at some of my journalist friends. They're traumatized um, because they consciously un or unconsciously became part of these dominant narratives of angels um, and, and, and uh, devils. Uh, some of our channels started talking about the good guys. Um, and, and therefore, when you see, for instance, in the leaks, that uh, some, someone is a part owner of a, a TV channel donated, how much? Two million or something like that? Hmm. You wonder whether it is by accident that ENCA and ANN7 became two sides of the same coin, as far as I'm concerned. Because there was a point where I had no doubt that ENCA and ANN7 were two sides of the same propaganda coin when it came to uh, the clash of narratives um, in our politics. But also, sometimes you become so reductionist. For instance, people may be tempted to think that I'm saying if you support Ramaphosa, you are a bad person. Hmm. You know? Uh, others are tempted to think if you support Ramaphosa, it means you are inherently good. Hmm. If you support, let's say, or you defend Busisi Wemkwaban, you are inherently bad. And those who leaked the emails are inherently good. Whereas I think the emails were leaked for both reasons, noble and ignoble. So we must not be fooled into thinking that everyone who leaks information, information that may be beneficial to our democracy and to ourselves in the end, um, is doing so um, in the interest of justice. So there's a combination of motives that are at play here in, in how the actors are contributing to the battle. I suppose many listeners thinking through this might accept, look, this is, this is more complex than, than maybe it's been presented. And yes, maybe we've been a bit naive in the way we've portrayed what's happening in our country right now. But at the same time, it doesn't seem that the alternatives on offer give us any further reason for hope. What's your view on opposition politics in South Africa and the extent to which either it falls into the same traps that you've been identifying or not? Well, uh, pe people tend to think that our political crisis is constituted entirely by the crisis in the ANC, and that is false. Hmm. Ours is a generalized political crisis. When we talk about capture, to the extent that we must talk about capture, it is my view that it is our political class, not a political party. Hmm. It is our political class that is captured, which means if we must talk about any, a, a, an alternative, the question is, what is the alternative to this political class that is captured? And, and therefore, for me, the question of the opposition as uh, an alternative does not arise because ours, as I say, is a generalized political crisis, which means we need an, an alternative to this class 
as a whole. Let's go into that and let's look at, for example, the DA, for example. In what ways do you think the DA is representative of this class that you speak about? And in what ways do you think the DA advances the democratic agenda or, or takes it backwards? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question because people may be tempted to think I'm saying this political class is a monolith. Mm. It is, it is a, a political class of multiple political agendas, multiple ideological agendas, and, and so on. The, the, the problem uh, with the DA as far as I'm concerned, and that is why I do not see it as an alternative, is that the DA has misrepresented itself for too long. And I think in this election, uh, there's an extent to which voters, particularly black voters, started seeing that it is misrepresenting itself. And what I mean by that is that the, the, the main problem with the DA is its paternalistic colonial logic. Um, a colonial logic which seeks to keep major parts of the status quo, particularly the economic status quo, but using black voters as cannon fodder to achieve that end. In the same way, that you, you, you see a headline from The Economist just before uh, the election saying, Cyril Ramaphosa, South Africa's best bet. In the same way that many white voters said, I'm not voting for the ANC, I'm voting for Cyril Ramaphosa. So they see Cyril Ramaphosa as canon fodder. And that is how the, the DA, in my view, um, has positioned itself. When it comes to the EFF, mm. Mm. I, I am hesitant um, to opine too much about the EFF. Why is that? Because I think the EFF is still a snake um, that has not shed its skin so that we see what the real EFF is. Mm. Um, so I'm waiting for the EFF to shed its skin mm. uh, because I am not convinced that beneath that skin lies a revolutionary skin. Hmm. Look, I think that's a really important point that you make there as well, because I think our society deeply needs a critique of the EFF as well, and a critique that, that takes the EFF seriously, but also looks at its obvious flaws and deficiencies. And I'm not sure we've had a proper conversation about that, because the, the tenor of the debate is, is the EFF is fascist, and that causes the EFF's base to dig its heels in mm. and, and return fire with, with equal lack of nuance. But I think it is important for our democracy to, to look at the EFF and say, there is something to be critiqued here. For me, the critique that I think often hasn't been laid out in as much detail as it needs to is yeah. ironically the EFF similarity to the ANC, yeah. organizationally and through its rhetoric. And although we draw this great binary right now between the ANC and the EFF, in many ways, there are great similarities between those parties. A lot of the EFF's politics, consciously or unconsciously, derives itself from ANC politics. And that might be a point in which we question whether the EFF does represent a true alternative to the dominant politics we see today. Well, I mean, I, I asked uh, the question whether liberal democracy serves us. And, and, and one of the conversations we must have is whether we do have a democracy in South Africa. Um, to the extent that if we must talk about these pro procedural dimensions, um, it can be argued um, if those of us of a conservative bent who believe in the idea of democratic consolidation may argue that we, we have done well procedurally, we have democratic mm. rights, freedom of expression, we vote every five years. Although, in my view, our elections have become a mere ritual. Um, there's no connection between our elections um, and the lived reality of South Africans, particularly those um, who are poor, who are workers, who were oppressed um, during apartheid. Mm. We seldom talk about our democracy in substantive terms. We, we tend to talk about it in um, procedural terms, when we extol, for instance, the virtues of our, our constitution. There too, we, st we, we need to have a continuous conversation about 
uh, our constitution. And one of the questions we ask must be a constitution for who? Whose constitution? You know? Um, because I am convinced now, I have never been more convinced that South Africa is not going to change until and unless we change. And what must change about us is that we must develop the capacity to free ourselves from the known. And that does not mean you abandon the known or you discard the known. You build on the known. And, and the process of freeing yourself from the known is a continuous and eternal um, process. And there's, a, a, for me, a very interesting relationship um, between freeing yourself from the known and going back to understand the known and how you change it uh, to effect a better future for, for, for society, you know. Uh, and that is why in that tweet, what I'm saying mm. is that we must not marry ourselves to the known. We must not attach ourselves to the known. If we are going to effect change and if we are going to do so successfully, it will be because we have succeeded with ensuring that on a continuous basis, we engage in that struggle of freeing ourselves from the known. And secondly, the struggle I, I spoke about earlier of appreciating the difference between words and what they describe. And in that process of trying to grapple with the unseen, the, the unknown that, that needs to come into being in our, in our country, what do you think the citizen's role is? The citizen who, you know, may have some allegiance to one or other party, but is open-minded. The citizen who relies on the media to get a deeper picture of what's happening in our society, but ultimately must make their contribution in one way or another. What, what are the kinds of questions that the ordinary person listening right now should be asking themselves about how we transcend what we know and go into a new phase in our society? Firstly, the citizen must remember how it is the ordinary black South African in particular who facilitated the emergence of the democratic breakthrough in 1994. It is the South African citizen who removed Jacob Zuma, not the ANC. Because remember that the ANC defended Jacob Zuma and removed him for the same reason, to protect the interests of his leaders. So when it was in the interests of his leaders to defend him, they did so. When they, first, they, when they faced the real prospect of losing an election in May, they abandoned him. And I'm telling you, they are going to do the same with Cyril Ramaphosa. Fees must fall. Um, although we may argue some mistakes were made, which revolution proceeds without making mistakes? Um, it is ordinary South Africans, young South Africans, who forced the government to do what conservatives in the ANC have said can never happen. It's unaffordable and all that. Of course, that came with its own problem. The, the narrow point I'm making here is that we have examples of ordinary South Africans. Take the TAC case mm. of uh, antiretroviral drugs. It is ordinary South Africans, not the ANC, not the DA or any other political party, which forced change on a government that was refusing to change. So there's, only, there's already demonstrable evidence that the ordinary South African can force change, can bring about change. But what needs to happen, amongst others, is that we do need to give narrative dignity, firstly, to women. And secondly, we need to give narrative dignity um, to the poor, uh, to workers, uh, to those who were oppressed during apartheid. In other words, we need to give narrative dignity to those who do not access economic, political, and other realities through English. Because that's another problem we have in this country. Hmm. Uh, we think English defi defines our social, political, and economic reality. 
Whereas it means if, for instance, the only language through which you have contact with political, social, economic reality and the news is English, you have a very partial access to the total social, political, economic and other realities in South Africa. So freeing ourselves from the known is also in part about freeing ourselves from English. And just to round off, as we bring this conversation to a close, I think what I appreciate about your analysis as well is you're often prepared to look ahead and not just behind. And of course, predictions in political analysis are never a good idea. Yes. But looking ahead sometimes is a good idea. And what do you see... Um, just forecasting a bit beyond the news cycle in the way that some of these battles are being yeah. are being played out? Well, predictions are not a problem. Eng English gave us good words like however. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the political analyst <laughs> on, staple. On, on the other hand. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Um, after the Pulukwane um, conference, I made a prediction. I argued that the ANC is not going to get out of this continuum of decline uh, of uh, intense in battles before 2029. And I think the ANC is on track uh, in that respect. Hmm. Um, I also argued that as long as the ANC remains the dominant power, South Africa does not get out of its current challenges before 2029. Even there, I'm being um, generous. So if we stay on the current trajectory and the ANC remains... Um, in power. We are looking at the real possibility of a president, Didi Mabuza, and probably Deputy President um, Paul Mashadile. We are looking at that possibility because wh while we're busy talking about the president uh, being on the back foot, people are beginning now to position themselves in case he does not survive these battles. But what does this mean for the country? What it means for the country is that the country must remember that in the past three elections, the ANC has been losing about 4% support, which means if we stay on this trajectory, the ANC is out of power um, within the next three elections. In which case, in my view, no dominant party emerges. You have some coalition arrangement possibly even more um, instability for some time. Which means what we need is an act of reimagining our future, with or without the ANC, and with or without the current crop of opposition parties. Now, of course, in the meantime, the reality is that if the ANC goes out of power, it is these opposition parties that will replace it. Then we must have a deeper conversation, first of all, about what kind of society do we want to be? And therefore, what kind of political parties, political system, constitution, and so on will give us that kind of society? Koko Obri Machikli, thank you so much for joining us on 702. Tawaz Thanks for watching the content. Like, share, and subscribe on all platforms, smwx.co.za to join the WhatsApp channel. And let's build a new conversation for a new generation. Are you, are you?